Good evening and welcome to the United Presbyterian Church of Plainfield, New Jersey's midweek service on this Thursday evening, February the 1st, 2024. We're a short 14, a very, we have a very few days before we begin the Lenten season, which starts on February the 14th this year with Ash Wednesday. We praise and thank and praise God for you being with us today and thank and praise God for the opportunity for us to fellowship together. We trust God that his Holy Spirit will bless us so that our meeting tonight will be effective. Let me bring you up to date on our announcements. There are five. Um, the first three we mention all the time and I hope you are taking note of that. Like and follow the UPC Facebook page. Subscribe to this YouTube channel if you have not done so before. Join us Monday through Friday at 6 a.m. for morning prayer, morning devotions, really. We try to do 15 minutes, but sometimes the discussion gets so good that we end up going a little bit longer. So if your schedule permits and you're up, please join us for prayer and Bible reading Monday through Friday at 6 a.m. via Zoom. February the 11th, 7.30 p.m. via Zoom, the UPC 2024 Lenten study begins. That's February the 11th, that's on a Sunday at 7.30 p.m. via Zoom. The book we are using is Give Up Something Bad for Lent by James W. Moore. Give Up Something Bad for Lent by James W. Moore. The UPC Ash Wednesday service will be February the 14th, which is also Valentine's Day, and it will start at 5 p.m. That is to allow all of our members, or most of them who are able to come in, and give them an opportunity to come in and fellowship with us. That's Wednesday, February the 14th at 5 p.m. I think I typed a six on the screen. I probably didn't have my glasses on, but the time is actually 5 p.m. That's our Ash Wednesday service. I don't think there are any other announcements, but if there are announcements related to the United Presbyterian Church, please be sure and include them in the chat section. The one announcement I should mention is that the memorial service for our beloved late minister of music, Mr. Ron Daniels, will be held Saturday, February the 10th. The viewing begins at 10 a.m. from 10 to 11, the visitation, and then the actual service, memorial service, begins at 10.30, from 10.30 to 11.30. And uh, repast will follow right here in, our, in the Lind Room. So the um, church is working very hard to honor Ron in an appropriate way. He was such a devoted um, such a good colleague, a man who understood the church very well, and I am confident that he is resting with Jesus tonight. So keep those announcements in mind and be sure and read our newsletter. Um, for those of you who um, don't know, you can go to www.upcplainfield.org and you can download a copy of the newsletter if you'd like to print it or read it online. So we have a newsletter for each month of the year. Please go through and read it, especially this um, February newsletter. For those of you who may not um, get it in mail in the mail on time, because they won't be mailed out until tomorrow, um, we're looking at 2 Chronicles 7, 14. And for, from the time you receive the newsletter, and since I'm telling you tonight, from the time you receive this message, I'm asking those of you who are able, um, please pray with me up until Ash Wednesday every day to study, meditate upon, and apply 2 Chronicles 7.14. God bless you. Tonight's lesson, we're looking at question 90 of the Westminster Shorter Catechism. As always, we will review. Well, if we have time, we will review. If not, we will begin by exploring a key term 
First, we will analyze the scriptural proofs offered for question 90 and discuss those proofs. The only um, key term I want us to focus on tonight is the word effectual. The term effectual means successful in producing a desired result or outcome. That's slide five. Successful in producing a desired result or outcome. Now, we're going to dive right into question 90. And um, maybe we'll read, um, define the word in context to make it clearer for some. So let's read the question. The question is, how is the word to be read and heard that it may become effectual or that it may produce the desired outcome? How is the word that is to us? It's like someone asking us the question, how do you read or we ask the question, how do we read and hear the word so that the word produces the desired outcome for our lives. What is that outcome? That we become more godly or unto salvation. So if we are saved or born again in the body of Christ, how does the word help us become more godly? A paraphrase is, um, this is the first time in a long time I've done this. You try and paraphrase it yourself without losing the meaning of the sentence or the question. And so here is my paraphrase. How do we read and hear the word so that it produces the desired outcome or salvation? You may have a different um, paraphrase, but it should say something similar to that because the question is posed, how do, how do we do it? Keep that in mind as we're reading it. How do we do it? And the proofs are going to show us what the framers of the Westminster Catechism thought, ways they gave us biblical answers to that question. The answer is that the word may become effectual to salvation or that the word may help produce salvation. We must attend thereunto with diligence, preparation, and prayer. Receive it with faith and love. Lay it up in our hearts and practice it in our, our lives. Now that's a mouthful. And so I tried to do almost a um, word by word paraphrase and uh, maybe the final paraphrase summarizes it best. And so this is my paraphrase. The word becomes effectual to salvation when we prayerfully and diligently study the word of God, coupled with prayer and faith in the word and in God to help us receive the word and hear it and to interpret it according to God's will for the purpose of hiding the word in our heart to put into practice what the word says. So when we study the word and hear the word and hear it with an int our intentions are to, uh, uh, what can I say, receive it so that we are then able to apply the word to our lives. Another way to paraphrase it might be, we study the word of God to learn God's will and learn how to apply it to our lives. That's a simpler way. So that's another way of paraphrasing um, or understanding, explaining, I should say, not so much a paraphrase, but another way of explaining what question 90 is about. How do I, now you should put your name in there. How do I, in my case, Allegra, you would say whatever your name is. How do I, Jean or Jane or um, Joseph or Robert, whatever your name is, how do I hear and read the word in such a way that it's, it becomes effective, it strengthens me spiritually. It strengthens me spiritually because that is the desired result of reading and studying the word. How do I do that? What method do I use? What methods or methodology, what practices do I put into reality in order for the word to have the desired, the biblical de, um, desired result in my life. Now let's look at the proofs. There are about eight of them. The first proof is Proverbs 8.34. Blessed are those who listen to me 
watching daily at my doors, waiting at my doorway. This says happy or having God's favor are those who listen to God watching daily, calling upon the Lord, waiting in expectation that God will hear and answer them and guide them. So as we're reading, we're not, we don't, we should never go to the word of God with the intention. I won't say never, but if we're intending to grow, the purpose is not to go with an idea and say, well, I'm going to find out. I want the Bible to prove this. The better way to do it is to say, this is what I believe. Let me see what the word of God says. Does what I believe line up with the word of God? And if not, why doesn't it? Where did that belief come from? How, um, that's what we should ask. And then the other thing is, how do I then, or pray more really, God help me so that your word takes root in my heart so that I'm able to understand your word in a way that helps me grow my faith, grow closer to you, and live a more godly life, a life that pleases you. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 34. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, this is how you read and hear the word of God. We're on slide 7. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow in your salvation. That's how we read the word. Our desire is to grow closer to God, to know more about God, and to know more about how to live in ways that are pleasing to God, live a godly life that God is pleased with. Psalm 119 verse 18 says, Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. Help me to understand your word, Lord. Open my spiritual eyes so I see myself in your word. Give me spiritual ears to hear your word for me, for my congregation, and for the body of Christ. But it always starts with the individual. Help me to hear your word for my life and to see myself in scripture. How does this scripture apply to me? What am I to do with it? How do I put it in practice? Help me to see the benefits of abiding by your word. Hebrews Chapter 4, verse 2. For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us, just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them, because they did not share the faith of those who, be, who obeyed. Because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Here we see the author is clearly making a distinction between believers, those who are in and I would suggest in the body of Christ, but who have not accepted the word of God. I would let me not say in the body of Christ, but in a religious institution. And they are entrenched in it, um, often very heavily involved in it, but somehow the word has not been made effectual unto salvation. Well, you say, well, pastor, where do you get that from? How do the framers, how did they come to that conclusion? Well, if you look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, and Psalm 119, it is clear, but especially if we look at 1 Peter chapter 2, they did not rid themselves. Those ungodly tendencies, um, those who submit to them, who engage in them, those behaviors that are antithetical to everything the Bible teaches is proof that we have not grown in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not being judgmental because I'm looking, we should be looking at ourselves. And so this is why when we read that passage from Hebrews, we have to ask, do we still have those things? Do we pretend to be one thing when we're something else? Do we still continue 
to steal, to commit theft, whether it's the theft of other people's ideas, other people's property, not does someone else do it, am I prone to that? Do I still look for ways to undermine, to deceive? Do I still look for ways to elevate myself instead of elevating God? Do I look for ways, do I slyly say things to discredit other people, to demonize them to my advantage? Do I look at the good that other people do and criticize it instead of praying for them, even if they're not doing the best, the best that I think they should be doing? What is my responsibility to pray for them or to slander them? And so when we look at Hebrews 4 and 2, that's what it says. If I'm still doing those things, then I'm not reading the word in the right way. I'm not hearing it in the right way. I'm not hearing it as God's message to me, calling me to a higher place in his, um, I want to say, in his, I started to say in his kingdom, but I mean for him to have control of my life. That's not why I'm reading it. That's not why I'm studying it. That's not why I went to seminary or I'm going to seminary or taking a position in a church. I'm doing these things because they benefit me. And so immediately I have already, I'm not, I am in that place where I am not allowing the word to be effectual, to produce the desired result, which is godliness. I'm not allowing it because I'm not interested in it. I may be able to quote it. I might be able to quote it from front to back. But my behavior, as Jesus said, um, you shall know a tree by its fruit. The fruit I'm producing is not the fruit of the spirit. It is self-serving, vindictive, and it, in many instances, it's just evil. They heard just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them. That's where we don't want to be. We don't want to be people who just hear the word and are not doers of the word as well. We hear it, but it's not producing any fruit in us because we're not yielded to the spirit of the living God. So how does the word aid in salvation? It gets, well, let's keep reading and then we'll talk a little bit. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse 10 is the key verse. But I, as you can see on the screen, I have highlighted verses nine, 11 and 12. So let's read it. The coming of the lawless one will be accompanied by the working of Satan with every kind of power, sign, and false wonder. This we should not be surprised because the enemies of God are always able to do a measure of miracles, but there comes a point where they are stopped. Nevertheless, they are able to fool a lot of people by their slick talk, um, and by the things they do and say. Um, and it seems almost unbelievable, but we see it all the time. I like to bring up three of the most, um, in recent years, people that prove this. That is Jim Jones in Guyana, Warren Jessups out in Utah, and then Charlie Manson. Now there are others, but those are the three that come to mind because they are probably the easiest three to research. They're the ones who I think of immediately because Jim Jones and Warren Jessup have been able to use, and Charlie Manson too, though to use the Bible to literally convince people to follow them to do evil things. The coming of the lawless one will be accompanied by the working of Satan with every kind of power sign and false wonder. God is the only creator. Satan cannot create anything. And so what he does is he imitates whatever godly, whatever godly things there are, he imitates them when it's to his benefit. He goes to prayer meetings to see how people pray. And then he learns to imitate their prayers. So they're hollow, but they sound absent the spirit. That's why you need the spirit of discernment. They sound almost 
like the children of God. So Satan is a great imitator. He runs to meetings to find out what other people are doing so that he can imitate what they're doing, to distract from them, to take away from them, to build up himself with every kind of power, sign, and false wonder. Here's the key verse. And with every wicked deception directed against those who are perishing because they refuse the love of the truth that would have saved them. We're free moral agents. We can choose right from wrong. When we pray and ask God to speak to our hearts, to reveal the truth, we have to be willing to accept it. And sometimes the truth tells us that we're wrong. It tells us that we're out of God's will. And so instead of rebelling against God, the thing to do is what they often did in the Old Testament, but the New Testament people did it too. And that is to, in both the Old and New Testament, to repent. In the Old Testament, they did it in a way by wearing sackcloth and ashes and um, a lot of fasting and praying. In the New Testament, it means something similar. It means that we repent. We acknowledge to God that we're wrong and that we are godly sorry. We're sorry that we violated your will. We're sorry that you're not pleased with us, God. We want to please you and we vow, I will change God if you help me. I can't do it by myself. You see, and if we're not able to do that, This scripture says, because they refused, they refused the love of God. They refused the love of the truth that would have saved them. They didn't want to hear it because it did not agree with what they said. We're not talking about one act. We're talking about a condition of a heart that says, I, and this is what the Bible's talking about, not one act, but a condition of the heart that compels us to reject the things of God in favor of ourselves, in favor of our own dreams and ambitions, our own ideals, so that in essence, we become our own little gods with the G, because we don't have any power. We're going to die just like everybody else and face the judgment. For this reason, God will send them a powerful delusion so that they believe the lie in order that judgment may come upon all who have disbelieved the truth and delighted in wickedness. When you get a chance, read it. Again, beginning at the second verse, on the 10th verse, the coming of the lawless one will be accompanied by the working of Satan. Don't be fooled. by what people say. Try the spirits to see whether they be of God or not. The spirit of God is always love. The spirit of God always looks to effect peace, unity. It seeks to build up, to encourage, not with a bunch of scriptures, but scripture can be a part of it, but in helping people be aware that they are created by God in God's image. Every single person that we meet, you are created by God in God's image and God loves you. That's what it is. It seeks to encourage. And when we're not doing those things, <coughs> we're not fulfilling the law of love. Psalm 119, verse 11. Your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Somewhere the scripture says that the spirit will give us utterance when we need to know what to say. When we memorize scripture, and we don't have to memorize it exactly, but <coughs> when we memorize the essence of scripture, when it becomes a part of us, 
we do that so that we will know how to live right, how to please God. And when we find ourselves transgressing God's laws, whatever they are, no matter how small it is, however small way it is, God will, God the Holy Spirit will convict us of sin and remind us you're on the right road headed in the wrong direction. Or it might say, you know, you're on the wrong road altogether. But he will bring to our remembrance scripture that reminds us of the difference between what, between right and wrong. We choose whether we will follow the path of righteousness, to love, help, encourage, build up, or whether we choose to destroy, undermine, discredit. Those are choices that we make. Psalm 119 reminds us that when we hide the word of God in our hearts, we do so so that we won't sin at all, so we know what sin is. But if we do sin, we know that we have an advocate with Christ Jesus who intercedes for us constantly. And all we have to do is repent. God, have mercy upon me because I was wrong. I need your help. Deliver me. I did it again. Whatever it is, I was a glutton. And I mean glutton in all of its form. Most people think about food and drink, but you can be a glutton about anything. I spent too much time watching TV. I ran home to watch the NFL or football instead of studying the word or visiting the sick. I spent too much time watching movies or binge watching instead of sleeping to rest my body. I spent too much time at the office instead of spending time with my family. I spent too much time thinking about how to satisfy myself instead of how to please you and how to help others. I spent too much time figuring out how to get out of doing something instead of doing what needed to be done. That's what the Spirit does, reminds us. It convicts us. It doesn't condemn us. It convicts us and gives us an opportunity to repent. Luke chapter 7, verse 15. Talking about the seeds, sower and the seeds. As for that in the good soil... They are, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart. Look at the series we've been doing the last three Sundays, I believe, on the heart. The divided heart, the repentant heart, and the loving heart. Hearing the word, they hold the word of God in an honest and good heart. Their intentions are good. The scripture says God looks upon the thoughts and intents of the heart. He looks at our motives, not just what we do. And so when we, that's the way we should read and hear the word of God, whether it's through the preaching or teaching. No matter who's doing it, that's what we should be looking for. What is the word for my life? Not, is, not what is the word so I can see whether the other person is right or whether the other person is wrong. If we start at that from that point, we're already wrong because we have no intention of using the word to grow. We have intention of using the word as a weapon against other people. And the scripture is very clear. It says, judge not lest you be judged. And a, more, and a practical question is, why spend time trying to discredit other people instead of trying to grow? To me, it's like an athlete, and a runner who spends their time criticizing every other runner and they don't spend any time practicing criticizing other runners the form of other athletes um, their skills but they themselves do nothing wouldn't it make sense to pour that those criticisms upon oneself to say God how can I be better how can I be more pleasing to you Mine is not the job to go around trying to find fault with other people or trying to get other people to agree 
with me in demonizing or discrediting others. That is, an, I mean, and when you look at the Bible, I don't find any place for that kind of thinking. The Bible doesn't, it shouldn't even say I don't find any place. I don't see any place in the Bible where that happens with Jesus. When it falls on good soil, that means it goes into a heart that is humbled and repentant, that wants to please God, that strives to please God, is not part of an author of confusion, does not throw fiery darts, does not allow the devil, and that's what it is, the fiery darts of the devil against other people will not be used as a weapon to hurt the brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what we look for. God, how do I be, how can I be more holy, more godly? When we go with that intention, we believe it because Jesus said, you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you shall find it. Hold it fast in an honest and good heart. Sometimes we honestly make mistakes like Paul did. Paul didn't go around trying to discredit people. He thought that the Christians were just wrong. And he was so sure that they were blaspheming God that he wanted to kill them because he thought what they were doing was against God, not against him, but against God. And it wasn't until the Damascus Road experience that his eyes were opened. That's what happens when we really want to serve God, no matter where we are, the spirit will arrest us and make it clear to us that we're wrong. That goes back to Psalm 119, 11. The word is hidden in our hearts. And so the spirit stirs it up and says, you know, you're wrong. But you can be right because Jesus died for you. God loves you. And then James chapter 1, verse 25. Whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. It's not always easy to do the right things. We're human. We have feelings. There's a scripture that says, be angry, but sin not. So when we realize that we're going in the wrong direction or we're doing something wrong, it's so simple. All God asks is that we stop, acknowledge the wrongfulness, and ask for forgiveness and ask him to help us. When we approach reading and studying the word, and that's what it should be, every time we pick up the word of God, what is God's word for me? And if you're reading and say, well, you know, I didn't see anything that applied to me today, you just keep on reading because you will. And it may not be for your personal life at the moment that you're reading it, but as you meditate upon it, the time will come where what you have read will be beneficial not only to you for your personal spiritual growth, but for sharing with others who may need to hear it. Not in a judgmental way, not in a condemning way, but in a way that says, my brother or my sister, I hear you. I empathize with you. I don't have the answers, but I know a man who does, and that man's name is Jesus. And then you're able to say, let me show you what the word of God says that speaks to your situation. I don't know how God is going to work it out, but I know that he will because his word says so. He promises that. And so I will pray with you and for you. Don't make promises that you can't keep. It doesn't mean that what you're asking for, my brother or sister, will turn out exactly the way you want it to. But if your prayer is, God, let your will be done. And then you leave it with Jesus. God will work it out. To his glory 
and to your good. To God's glory and to your good. So it may be that today you're reading something that you say, you know, I'm not really sure how to apply it. That's okay. God help me to hold, hide this word in my heart so that when it is needed, the Holy Spirit can recall it. And it will be effectual not only for my own spiritual growth, for my own personal spiritual growth in my walk with you, but beneficial to someone else who is growing so that I am able to rightly divide the word of truth. So I'm not simply saying things that sound good and may be good and may be well intended, but do not appropriately um, fit the situation. But I'm saying them because I don't know what else to say. So God help me to hide this word, whatever it is, in my heart. So when I need it, your spirit can recall it to my memory. And then pray, help me to say things in the right spirit when the opportunity presents itself. My brothers and sisters, that concludes our lesson tonight. Remember, it's a very um, interesting and profound question. How do I, put your name in there, Allegra, Cassandra, Julian, Mavis, Roberto, Devin, how do I hear and read the word so that it is entering me in such a way that it produces spiritual growth? That's what it is. How? So as we're reading and meditating on 2 Chronicles 7, 14, a very familiar passage of scripture over the next 13 or 14 days, depending upon when you hear the message and, or when you receive the newsletter, um, follow those steps that I've outlined, very simple steps, um, to help you break the passage down and know how to apply it every day and then get up every day with the mind, God help me absorb this scripture in my life. I don't want to be able to just recite it. I want to be able to know it. I want to hide it in my heart, Lord, so that I can depend upon it. And then trust God for the outcome. Faith in God. Faith in God's love for every single person. Faith in God's love to save, deliver, and to keep. Faith in God's word that God, you are somebody in Christ. Everybody is important. Faith to know that there are no big eyes and little U's in Jesus' kingdom. Jesus is the only big one. He's the head of the church. Faith to understand the wisdom and discernment to understand that religious institutions are not God and often do not represent God. They are certainly not the body of Christ. And that the body of Christ is not a religious institution. It is made up of the believers in every generation and Jesus Christ is the head. It's not a denomination. It's not a doctrine. Pray for God to help you understand those things and that God loves all people everywhere. He's just as concerned about the people who live in the bush in Australia and the deepest forest in the Amazon as he is about the Palestinians in Palestine and the Jews, wherever they are. He's just as concerned about the police officer, correctional officer, as he is about a teacher, a stay-at-home mom, an out-of-work dad, the disabled. God cares about us all. The most marginalized people in a society, for whatever reason, because of the way they look, the way they dress, their accomplishments or lack of them, 
God cares about us all. And so when we approach the Bible, let us approach it that way. To hear, read, and understand God's word for our lives. God bless you, my friends. Thank you so much for joining us. Before we close, we have a few minutes. Let me pray, and um, then we will be finished. Most gracious and holy Father, we praise you for being the creator, redeemer, and sustainer of our souls and of all things great and beautiful. Lord, we thank you so much for opportunities. We thank you for Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, the precious Holy Spirit, our teacher, our comforter, our guide. Oh God, we're so thankful to you for loving us even while we were yet still living in sin. We're so thankful that you did not require that we clean ourselves up before we come to you, but that you have accepted us just as we are with all of our faults. We're so grateful to you as the songwriter said that you looked beyond our faults and saw our needs. Gracious God, we thank you for another day among mortals to participate in your redeeming and nurturing process. Oh God, forgive us if we have neglected to do it today. And if we should rise tomorrow, help us to rise with a different mindset. And that is to do your will, to know your will and to do it. Father, help us to want to please you. Help us want to love you. Not to bend because you are all powerful, but to begin because we love you, Lord. To bend our will to your will. To love others as you have loved us. To embrace your word, to hide it in our hearts. Oh, gracious God, we ask this in the name of Jesus. Of course, Lord, we pray for the sick, those in hospitals, assisted living facilities, nursing homes, those living in violent prone and abusive households and communities, for those living in and near war-torn countries, for the hungry, the homeless, the dejected, those living on the fringes of society who have been ostracized through no fault of their own simply because of the way you have created them different. Whatever that difference is, God have mercy. Let your love shine through. We know it shines, but somehow help them to see your love and to let them know, help them understand that you love them and they're good enough for you no matter what the world says. Most gracious and holy Father, I pray that you will touch the heart of the bad men and women, the bad men and women, who have plotted to do evil against your people, who disrespect you and your word, who mock you by doing evil while, call, while calling your name, we pray first and foremost for their soul salvation. We pray that the Holy Spirit will convict them, will break the chains that have them bound. So they will see the evilness of their ways, even if they've gotten away with it in this world. Oh, gracious God, we pray that you will bring them to your saving knowledge. Lord, you said one plants, another waters, another gives the uh, another reaps but that you give the increase. Gracious God, we want to be planters and waterers and reapers. Give us love and compassion for all people, especially those who need it the most. Save the bad man and woman. Your word says you're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to your knowledge and so we pray you said we should always pray and so we pray god save god save god save not just our children not just the people we love but save those who appear to be unlovable oh gracious god we ask you to have mercy 
We ask you to heal emotions, mental conditions, low self-esteem, people who are battered by life's trials. God, we beseech you in the name of Jesus. We know you said, don't be overcome, don't let evil overcome us, but overcome evil with good. Father, we can't do it without your help. And so we pray for our brothers and sisters who are struggling, who are angry about everything that's happened to them, who are angry, embarrassed, and hurt. Oh, gracious God, we ask you to move by your spirit and help deliver. Father, as always, we pray for leaders everywhere that they will remember their roles, whatever titles they hold, and in whatever capacity, that they will remember they are in position to glorify you and to bring about the common good. Most gracious and holy Father, give them wisdom and understanding. We pray for our children to find employment, and that when they get there, they will be the best workers in their field, in their areas. If they're students, that they will be the most studious. And that wherever they are, their lights will shine. This is what we pray, that wherever we are, our light shines. Let your light shine through us so that we can be the light in the darkness, or that not only we can be the light, but people can see your light in the darkness and have hope. Gracious God, we ask for these things in Jesus' name. If there's anything we have neglected to pray for, we pray that you will grant it anyway, provided it is in accordance with your will. In the mighty and holy name of Jesus, we pray, and we trust you for the outcome. My brothers and sisters, have a great night. God be with you. Remember, God loves you. Jesus died for you. The Holy Spirit is real. He is the third person of the Trinity. He wants to save you and keep you from falling. If you do fall, he will pick you up and set you on the right path. We at United care very much about you. Please join us for our upcoming events. Those of you who knew Ron Daniels, we ask you to join us for his service on the 10th of February, Saturday morning at um, 10 a.m., then come back Sunday. Well, we hope you come back for our Sunday service at 11 a.m., our hybrid service. And then Sunday night, we're only doing the Lenten study on Sunday nights this year. 7.30 via Zoom. Give up something bad for Lent. Beginning from the time you hear this message, start reading Second Chronicles 7.14. Meditate upon it daily through, I said up and two, but through Ash Wednesday. And then join us on February the 14th for our Ash Wednesday service. God be with you. Keep me in your prayers. Have a great night.